So um, today we're going to be talking about uh, CAR T therapy. Um, I will start uh, since, as the rheumatologist of the um, group talking about um, scleroderma and and how it pertains to the these future treatments, including CAR T. And Dr. Nash will then review stem cell transplant treatment uh, and then CAR T therapy. Before we talk about scleroderma per se, um, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the immune system and, and how when it goes awry, it can contribute to autoimmune conditions. Now we understand that uh, the immune system is designed for uh, protecting us from uh, foreign invaders, viruses, and uh, bacteria and the like. It also surveils for cancer cells to get rid of them before they become too unwieldy. Um, it is a very efficient uh, system for grabbing things, eating them, taking them away, and uses a number of different uh, modalities to include proteins that poke holes into bacteria, um, antibodies, which are essentially hands with arms attached that grab pieces and parts and viruses, and then full uh, cells that will uh, devour bacteria and viruses whole and, and then digest them. So there are a number of different modalities. Uh, the other part of the immune system that's very important is that it has this ability to um, amplify itself. So if there's uh, a large uh, uh, bacterial infection, uh, the, you need to meet that with um, an amplified recruiting forces, whatever, to get rid of that. <clears throat> so understanding that it's very efficient for uh, grabbing things and taking them away and recognizing things, your body uses that system for normal janitorial services in the body. It's, the body's a messy place. Their cells die and uh, somebody has to clean up the mess. So the immune system does that by using antibodies, et cetera, to clean up pieces of dead cell and, uh, um, and take them away. However, while it needs to do those normal maintenance, we have to avoid the, um, the amplification process because if we have too many antibodies or too many cells that clear away material, then what happens is you'll develop uh, inflammation in healthy tissues. So we can understand something like thyroid disease, which is a situation where antibodies are um, uh, over, uh, um, in overabundance that attack the thyroid that causes thyroid um, malfunction and is treated with thyroid replacement. Um, multiple sclerosis uh, is an autoimmune condition that affects the neurons. Uh, the rheumatologic disease is that, that uh, we manage are um, much more systemic, so many more organs are involved. They all have their uh, different patterns in terms of the organs involved and the antibodies that are associated with them, such as lupus or uh, Sjogren's disease or scleroderma. Um, Oh, uh, sorry, I'm having trouble uh, forwarding the slide. Mm. You hit your space bar, it often works space better. Bar. Yeah. True. Mm. Not working. Hold on, I'll see if I can. Somehow, I can't even escape from this thing. Um, ah, let's see if this will work. Okay, so um, uh, now there are a lot of different, and everyone can hear me okay, correct now? Yeah, we can't see your uh, presentation though. You cannot see? No. Oh my God. Uh, okay, let me get try to get this thing back online. Uh, do you see me? We we do see you. Is the screen sharing still working? It it's not. Oh, okay. Let me go back to screen share. Okay, how's that? That's great. Okay, hopefully we'll we'll go keep going forward. So there are a lot of different cells that um that the immune system uses, and they have different um responsibilities. The important one to think about. Um, especially in terms of CAR T cell therapy is the B cell and T cell interaction. Um, so the B cell um, is, is, does a number of different, uh, has a number of different roles. Well, all different cells have different roles, but the B cells, they will um, be, they're part of the surveillance system. Uh, they go to the lining of the, in, the intestines, the lining of the lung, the skin, and they might take pieces of, of these of bacteria or viruses 
and, and bring them to the T cell at the local lymph node and say, oh, look what I found, what should I do with this? A T cell, which is the, you know, the commander of the, of the immune system might say to the B cell, oh, this is something foreign, go multiply, make more antibodies, go destroy that thing. Well, then the B cell might also take a piece of skin, for example, and say, well, I've got this piece, what should I do with it? And the T cell would say, well, um, this is part of us, go, go in the corner and shrink away, we don't need more of you. So an autoimmune condition is a situation where this interaction is, um, uh, has gone awry such that the B cell might present skin cell uh, samples, for example, and the, B and the T cell will tell it to go multiply and, and proliferate. And then, you, then it goes back to those tissues and, and inflammation and damage occur. Um, the T, uh, CAR T, the T of, of CAR T is um, uh, T cells. A lot of our treatments are geared toward how do we disrupt that interaction between B cell and T cell to create a more healthy working immune system um, now going to uh, scleroderma in particular, we know that this is a disease of uh, leather or scleroderma means leather or hide bound skin. Um, and as you see on the right, this is a uh, normal soft skin that is easily pinched. We have, you have sclerodermatous skin on the left that is uh, more coarse and harder to pinch. Um, skin is soft and mobile and, and doughy. And mainly that's because of the, the fat under the, our skin. Think of a baby who's got soft and silky skin. They have a lot of fat under their skin and you just want to pinch their legs. Um, in uh, scleroderma, the, you get an inflammation in that in the tissue under the skin. And if you see on the left, which is normal, you see a lot of fat right under the skin. Well, that gets replaced by, uh, after the inflammation, by uh, fibrosis and scar tissue. You, know, you can imagine that in this scar tissue, it's difficult for nerves and ar arteries to supply that area. The, the skin becomes dry, itchy, uh, for example. And then when it loses that uh, mobility, uh, you, you get that hidebound appearance or that hidebound texture, and that can limit, uh, for example, joint movement. And if joints don't move long enough, they're gonna be um, contracted and stuck in that position. Um, there are basically two distributions that we see limited and diffuse. And I wanted to put up this slide to just make sure that we understand that uh, limited and diffuse just refers to the distribution of the skin. Uh, it, it, the the activated, active skin is in purple here and in limited on the left, the skin is limited to uh, the area distal to the elbows and knees and in the face, whereas in diffuse it occurs in the proximal parts of the um, limbs as well as the trunk. Now, while diffuse um, scleroderma tends to be a more severe form, certainly you could have very severe forms of limited disease. So limited doesn't necessarily mean less severe in everybody. Uh, you can have lung disease or very severe skin disease. Uh, and the, the, the CAR T therapy that we're um, starting is going to be mostly um, geared toward diffuse skin because they tend to have more severe disease. But even patients with limited disease who may have lung disease um, will qualify for this study. It's essentially a study looking at skin and lung disease um, and how we might be able to treat that. Um, thinking about the uh, other organs that are involved, uh, Raynaud, starting with the lower left-hand corner and moving clockwise, uh, vascular um, Dysfunction is a, a, a very major part of, of what we see in scleroderma. Scler um, Raynaud's, which is a uh, problem with the uh, control of your circulation, your capillaries, and your fingers and your extremities, whereby the cold makes them turn white or purple or even black, and can develop years before the onset of scleroderma um, per se. Uh, moving up to ILD, which stands for interstitial lung disease, um, you, as we showed in the skin, you can get scarring and fibrosis in the lungs and you have poor air, air exchange and that is a um, not unusual cause of death in scleroderma. GI tract, gastroenterolo gastroenterolo um, the GI gastroenterologic uh, tract. This picture with the x-ray, um, uh, chest x-ray, there's a big white blob in the middle. That's some barium that is not successfully passing through the esophagus. And uh, if you have poor esophageal function, you'll have problems swallowing, heartburn, in the lower intestine, uh, 
constipation, poor uh, absorption, we want our scleroderma patients a little plump because that means that they're absorbing well. Um, moving to the right, uh, PAH, which stands for pulmonary artery hypertension, is a problem with the circulation in the lungs, the plumbing system, which over time, if you have a backup, causes uh, too much strain on the heart, also um, a significant cause of, of death. And in the lower, the renal, on the left is a normal uh, angiogram where you see nice perfusion throughout the kidney, whereas on the right, we have uh, scleroderma with poor uh, circulation. You can see how that kidney is not going to work very well. Um, this next is a, uh, uh, a slide depicting uh, mortality. Uh, this is from 2003, so 25 years ago, and I can tell you when I started training about 25 years ago, um, we all thought of scleroderma as a very grim, what we still do, but certainly then we, we just didn't have any treatment. Everything that tried would fail. Um, the uh, probability of survival is on the left, and, and the moving right is the time from diagnosis. The dark line is patients with scleroderma. The dotted line is the normal population. So you could see uh, moving down to the 10, after 10 years, maybe 10% of the normal population has died, but, um, uh, but 40 plus percent of patients with scleroderma have died. It's a devastating um, problem. Um, since then, we've been using uh, standard autoimmune disease treatments such as methotrexate, mycophenolate, mofetil, or selceptin steroids. I don't have the time to talk about all these medications, but understand that these are the usual first-line treatments, and they can be okay. I mean, when we use them, um, I have some patients that do well with them. They don't need to go on to more advanced therapy, but there are a lot of patients that don't respond to these, and that's why uh, we, um, we've moved on to stem cell treatment which was initiated about 25 years ago. Um, and then uh, now we're at the dawn of CAR-T therapy, um, which Dr. Um, Nash will explain. And so I'll turn this over to Dr. Nash now, but I'm trying to get rid of my screen share, so bear with me here. Um, good, thank you. You know, thanks very much, David. That, that was a great, uh, great review. Um, so I'm just going to carry on here, and um, I will share my screen. So um, <clears throat> as David said, we started doing transplants in patients probably 20 to 25 years ago. And I mean, it started very slowly. Um, and since the, the start, uh, we, were in, we randomized clinical trials have been done showing the, the benefit of, of uh, transplant. One of the things that um, trans, where transplants might be important is that uh, transplants, uh, this was really kind of the first time that, it, that a therapy could actually kind of was shown to improve kind of long-term outcome in patients. Uh, there are other therapies that have become available, but um, and they, they impact on the progression of the disease, but they don't appear to kind of put the disease into, into remission. Um, <clears throat> but there are two types of transplants. The transplant that we're doing primarily is autologous transplantation after high-dose immunosuppressive therapy. Um, we get rapid reduction of autoimmune effector cells, and there's a sustained immunomodulatory effect, uh, which I, I haven't uh, the data here to show you, but again, there's data showing that, that there's a um, immunomodulation of the um, of the immune system, resetting of the immune system, and then there's allogeneic transplantation where we would actually um, use a donor and then replace the host autoreactive immune system with a new immune system that that isn't uh, going to react um, with the against the recipient in terms of causing systemic sclerosis. The other thing that happens after allogeneic transplantation is that we see that there are going to be promotion of regulatory mechanisms that can control the autoimmune disease process. Uh, this is the kind of treatment regimen that we use. This is, uh, um, <clears throat> this is one approach. Uh, there are essentially two approaches. One is using high-dose cytoxin, which is here, uh, and the other is using cytoxin plus TBI, and then doing uh, CD34 selected transplants. And CD34 is the marker on stem cells that we could use 
to select stem cells and then uh, transplant those cells. <clears throat> After transplant, we use GCSF. And, um, and then we also give ATG, which is antithymocyte globulin, which is an antibody preparation for um, <clears throat> reducing the host uh, uh, immune system uh, that's causing the, the, the uh, uh, systemic sclerosis. Uh, we also, um, after the initial study that we did for the Scott clinical trial, which I will show in just uh, further down the road, uh, we started shielding the lungs and the kidneys to protect the lungs and the kidneys from the, the radiation. So that we went from a, a dose of 800 centigrades, which is here, to uh, 200 centigrades. So what we saw in terms of the skin score, um, as we started doing the, the transplants, and again, this goes back almost 20 or 25 years, is that we saw that the, um, in the skin score goes from zero to 51. You can see that some of these patients that brought into transplant had very high skin scores, but you can see the, the vast majority of patients started having a reduction in their, in their skin scores. And much of the reduction was happening within the first year, although it can take a long time for the fibrosis to resolve. Um, and this um, was really the first time that at that point where you could actually see that the, the skin scores were, were improving uh, associated with uh, the administration of uh, a therapy. Um, when we did the, when we did the uh, biopsies on the skin, you can see at the top here, um, you can see that this is a pre-transplant skin biopsy. On the left here is the um, low power um, uh, pre-transplant. The, the other one here is high power. And what you see here, is, as David was showing you on, on one of his um, on one of the slides, is that you can see that there's a lot of uh, collagen here, bundles of collagen, which is the, the fibrosis that we're seeing in the skin. And then as you follow patients, so the C and D, again, low power, high power, uh, at one year after transplantation, you can see that those uh, bundles of collagen have, have started to reduce in size. And then as we come out towards five years, we can see that really the appearance of the uh, subcutaneous tissue where the fibrosis was, has essentially normalized. And you can see here the, um, sorry, the, the slides are sort of slipping back and forth. We do a kind of a health, a modified health assessment questionnaire. And this is just kind of trying to determine the degree of disability, the function that patients have. And you can see here that there was uh, improvement in function of the majority of patients who went to, to transplant. And again, this is a phase two study that we did. And then based on that, and this is pulmonary function. And you can see on the left here is force vital capacity on the right is a DLCO, which is the ability of the, the lungs to transfer oxygen to the, to the blood. And you can see here that the, uh, there's a slight improvement in the force vital capacity. And I think a lot of this may relate to um, reduction of the scleroderma so that patients are then able to expand their chest and their lungs more. And then here you can see that the, uh, the effect of the transplant and DLCO was really kind of patients kind of maintained their DLCO over, over time. So based on, on the initial studies that we did, again, 20 or 25 years ago, <clears throat> we, a, a phase three study was started and that was uh, funded by the uh, NIH, uh, Keith Sullivan, who I worked with at Fred Hutch and then moved to Duke University. <clears throat> was the uh, primary investigator on the study. And it was a randomized trial of, of the high dose uh, therapy followed by autologous CD34 selected uh, stem cell transplantation and to see if that was more effective than standard uh, therapy. So <clears throat> patients were randomized. They're randomized into transplant or to uh, monthly cyclophosphamide. And you can see the um, randomization here in the screen. Uh, patients had to be between 18 and 69 years of age uh, patients had diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis with poor prognosis. Uh, disease duration had to be less than five years. And uh, internal organ involvement, they had to have uh, pulmonary disease or prior scleroderma renal crisis. And 
<clears throat> that study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, the, there was a follow-up study that Keith did with the NIH where they actually contacted patients to get late follow-up. And, um, and this is what they saw. So that with the intention to treat population, so these are patients who were randomized to receive transplant or to receive cyclophosphamide. And this was the outcome is that you can see here that um, again on the um, Y scale, the uh, is the proportion surviving. So this is the survival curve. And on the X scale here is years to death. You can see we uh, stop the follow-up of patients at about four and a half years after transplant. And then Keith did a longer follow-up on these patients. And you can see here that with the autologous transplant arm, that patients are really stabilized at about uh, three years after the transplant. Whereas with the monthly cyclophosphamide, there's a continual loss of life uh, related to the uh, disease progression or potentially other complications. For <clears throat> Because there were some patients that were so sick that were coming on to transplant, coming onto the transplant arm that didn't make it to transplant, Keith looked at the curve, looking at the patients who made it to transplant. And you can see here that, uh, you can see that again, at about three years after transplant, there's stabilization, very stable curve in terms of survival. And there's a continuing loss of survival here out towards uh, 10 years after, the, uh, after treatment started. And this is uh, cyclophosphamide in the blue line and in the dotted red line is transplant. And you can see that time to, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, time to death or to starting uh, um, a disease modifying therapy that basically 80% of the patients who are being treated with monthly cyclophosphamide had, had some uh, evidence of progression of the disease, whereas only 30% of the patients undergoing transplant had had some sign of progression. <clears throat> so there were three studies that have been done of uh, randomized clinical trials. One was the ASSIST trial, a second was the European trial, which was ASTIS, and then the NIH-sponsored trial, which was Scott, the Scott clinical trial. And <clears throat> you can see here that uh, all of these studies showed, and two of them were CD34 selected, one was unselected, but all showed that there was <clears throat> benefit in patients going to high-dose therapy and transplant. This is the ASTIS clinical trial. <clears throat> and I think this is interesting because the ASTIS clinical trial, this is where they gave high dose cyclophosphamide without the, the radiation dose. And you can see here that patients tend to stabilize at about two years after transplant or stable till about four or five years. And then we see that there's a uh, progressive loss of life, presumably from uh, progression of the disease, uh, still better than the control arm. But, but uh, so again, transplant with high dose cyclophosphamide still appear to be better statistically. Then comparing high-dose cyclophosphamide to cyclophosphamide and total body radiation, you can see here that with the ASTIS trial, they still had issues with uh, transplant-related mortality of about 10%, whereas Scott was about 3%. And then uh, post-transplant DMARG use, 22% at 24 months and 9% at uh, 54 months. So the, after the, the randomized clinical trials, and I was involved with the Scott clinical trial, uh, long-term follow-up up to 11 years after uh, treatment started, that there was a benefit to going to, uh, to transplant. Uh, survival estimates at 11 years after randomization were 88% survival after transplant uh, for patients with systemic sclerosis versus 53% after monthly cyclophosphamide. And again, that was st uh, statistically significant uh, <clears throat> compared to published results with non-myeloblative transplant. And this is where they just used the uh, high-dose cyclophosphamide. Um, there were lower rates on, on the Scott clinical trial of transplant-related mortality and a lower rate of patient of disease progression with patients going on to the Scott clinical trial where they had a more aggressive approach to, uh, uh, to their treatment. There were no late deaths or cancer observed in the transplant group and physical functioning and weight gain improved after transplant. And I think the other thing that we've noticed in, in transplanting patients, because we've continued to transplant patients after these results is that many patients come in with Raynaud's uh, significant pain or discomfort, especially in the extremities. And I think that 
we see improvements after transplant with the improvement of the skin. And I think that's one of the biggest uh, improvements I think that patients have in their quality of life. So <clears throat> the next step is in terms of trying to going to be well tolerated, safe, and effective is looking at CAR T cell therapies for autoimmune disease. And uh, most of those studies were just initiating clinical trials. So there's been a huge interest now based on some preliminary data that have been reported, and I'll get into that in just a second. But based on some early preliminary data, things have looked very promising and very interesting um, in some of the patients treated to date with CAR T cells. So, um, so what I'd like to do is just quickly kind of run a, a video, short video, just on clinical trials. And we'll just get it going here. People around the world are becoming more aware of new therapies that are being developed. These therapies, such as drugs and vaccines, are developed through clinical trials. All clinical trials begin with a question that scientists, including doctors <clears throat> and disease experts, want to answer. To do this, scientists prepare a development plan based on early studies done in the lab. Next, researchers submit a request to regulatory and government agencies, like the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the European Medicines Agency, to begin testing a new therapy in people. Once this request is approved, researchers seek volunteers to participate in clinical trials. The success of these trials depends on including a diverse group of people representative of those who may be treated by the new therapy if it is approved for use. There are four phases of clinical trials. During phase one, a new therapy is given to a small group of participants. The goals are to check the safety, find a safe dose, and track any medical problems. During phase two, researchers check the therapy's safety and how it works in participants with a specific disease or condition. During phase three, researchers check the therapy's safety and how well it works in a larger group of people with the specific medical condition. Phase four trials happen after a therapy has been approved and made available to the public. Researchers look at how the therapy works in the real world and its long-term effects. This whole process can take over eight years, and vaccine development typically takes even longer because there are more safety tests. This development process is important because it's the best way to ensure that the safest, most effective therapies reach the public. So... Uh, so the for CAR T cell therapy right now, the clinical trials are just starting and we're still very early. So we're really kind of at the stage right now of doing phase one clinical trials. Uh, and there we go. So the next uh, slide here is, is really to um, kind of describe what is happening with CAR T cell therapies. And, and these are uh, genetically modified cells uh, that are used to treat the disease. So we've now been doing these types of, of treatments for patients with cancer, with uh, uh, blood malignancies now for probably seven, eight, or nine years. And they're now FDA approved because of their effectiveness for uh, treating patients with lymphoma. Uh, studies were done in Germany, and, and that'll be the, the next set of slides I'll show, where actually the, uh, the CAR T cells that are used have been effective very, it appears anyways, in, in early studies that they can be very effective for treating patients with uh, autoimmune disease. Um, so I'm gonna try and uh, get this. Uh, there we go. I think we, we don't see it. Oh, is that right? If you're considering or recently prescribed. Okay. Um, so is this something you can you can share then from your screen? Uh... Um, let me try. Okay. Um... So it, it will kick you off of your screen sharing, just so you know. <laughs> oh, sorry? Yeah. 
because it still says here that I'm screen sharing. Yeah. So I, once I do this, it will knock your screen sharing off. Oh, so I just want to, yeah. okay, that's I'm going to try this. <laughs> okay. Can everybody see this? Yep. But Amanda, I can't I can't hear the uh Looking on to and attacking cancer cells. Being aware of these are the most important cells. Brown T cell therapy is only available for designated treatment sites. These locations may be different depending on the previous received cancer treatment. You should also note that some brown T cell therapies have been approved by the FDA. Amanda, I think people are having a hard time hearing the video. Oh. If you'd like, I can just sort of summarize what this what this movie will say. Yeah. All right. Would you okay. Like yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, if you remember that picture from before, where the B cells and the T cells interact, and the T cells are very important for um, controlling what the immune system will do, um, we recognize that T cells are also very important for um, uh, it, that picture was talking about how it can attack. Um, cancer cells. And what we've learned how to do with this technology called CRISPR is to introduce a piece of gene into a T cell. So we could take your T cell, send it to a laboratory in New Jersey or whatever, and then they put a, a, a gene in there that um, says, oh, this is a piece of cancer cell. Um, I, we're going to transfuse you back into your, your, your host, your, your body. And then those T cells will go and attack those cancer cells. So we're trying to use that. Um, and, and the T cells can get everywhere. I mean, as, as I said earlier, that the um, treatment, a lot of treatments for rheumatic diseases are trying to disrupt that B cell, T cell interaction when it's overactive. But a lot of those are just focusing on the B cells and how do we lower those B cells? Because we know that those are the antibody producers and they create a lot of the uh, framework for the inflammation to develop. Now, um, the, the CAR T therapy, which will take, um, we, we've been, or Dr. Nash has been using it for um, cancer cells, well, they're now programming in this study, it are now, they're, they're programming these T cells to attack B cells. And we're hoping that it can lower the, the over, overactive B cell population, not just in the blood, but also in the small corners of all the tissues um, to reverse that inflammatory process. Essentially, what we're trying to do is reset the thermostat, if you will. So if you have a situation where you have overactive B cells that are rogue and, ha and creating too many antibodies to healthy tissues, if you can cut down that B, uh, B cell population sufficiently, well, then hopefully we'll get into a situation where its immune system re-regulates itself and that those uh, overactive B cells then sort of fall back into line. Um, so that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. No, that's a good explanation. Okay, thanks. Thanks, David. And uh, so if we can just, I'll, I'll share then um, the screen again. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is to, um, is go over the, um, so hopefully everybody can see my slide again.
or this slide. Uh, but this is the, uh, the first, one of the first studies uh, reported on CAR T cell therapies for autoimmune disease. This is, was from Germany, Fabian Muller, uh, and this was just reported in, in the New England Journal of Medicine about uh, two to three weeks ago. But they, they uh, treated 15 patients. You can see here that the first eight patients, if you go to the first line, or the uh, third line here, the, the diseases, you can see that the first uh, eight patients were patients with lupus, lupus nephritis. There were three patients uh, with idiopathic inflammatory myositis. And then there were four patients with uh, systemic uh, sclerosis. And the, the patients, you can see in the next line, the disease duration, that uh, patients had had their disease for two years, uh, one year for the third patient here and 11 years for the, the fourth uh, scleroderma patient. Um, and the follow-up was still very short. So I think that we all have to be careful about the interpretation of the data, but I think that people are very excited about the potential effects of, uh, of CAR T cell therapy in patients with autoimmune disease. You can see here that uh, of these four patients, three patients had an autoantibody called SCL70. One patient had an antibody called RNA polymerase 3. Um, <clears throat> I thought this was actually very interesting that all four patients had uh, skin involvement. Uh, one patient had severe uh, uh, kidney involvement and still appeared to have a beneficial effect. Uh, the uh, patients also had uh, lung disease. And I think, again, this is very interesting that two of the patients had uh, significant heart disease. And again, for uh, patients with heart disease or significant kidney disease, we have not been treating those patients with high dose therapy and transplant because of the perceived uh, risks. And these are the therapies that patients had failed before coming on to the CAR T cell therapy. Um, and again, going to the last four lines here, patients had failed uh, corticosteroids, had failed mycophenolic mofetil, uh, azathioprine. Uh, down at the bottom here, uh, two of the uh, patient 14 and patient 15 had failed tocilizumab and then, uh, then tetanib um, in patient 15, which are agents that have been more recently approved for the treatment of scleroderma. <clears throat> so, the, and again, this is a complicated slide, so I'm just gonna go through things, um, just take you through this. So the first eight patients, again, are lupus patients. They all had significant disease coming into, into treatment. And, and one of the interesting things here, the sled eye score, is the SLE, the lupus uh, disease activity index, and all of the, the scores have basically, the scores have come down to zero in all of the patients. Uh, patients were off treatment, they were in a glucocorticoid free state, and there was uh, no immunosuppressive drugs being given. So again, that's the first eight patients. Uh, in terms of idio uh, the idiopathic inflammatory myositis, uh, patients again were off therapy and appeared to be responding. And then in uh, scleroderma, and again, follow-up is short, uh, the, uh, they have a U-star AI score, which is European score for measuring the activity of the disease, and there was improvement. And then looking at the skin, there was also significant improvement uh, in patients um, after uh, treatment, and uh, they were also off uh, uh, glucocorticoids and immunosuppressive drugs. Again, if we, so that's in that kind of upper panel. If you go down here to B, long-term outcomes in patients with lupus, <clears throat> you can see that the, uh, in this first graph here in B, the sled eye score was very high in these patients and all had come down to zero after uh, treatment. The anti-double-stranded DNA antibody had also come down. Um, <clears throat> and in the, the patients with scleroderma, there are two, graphs here. And um, one can see again that there's improvement in the U-star uh, AI score, and then there's improvement in the skin score. And again, it can take years for the skin score to improve because you have to have uh, re, uh, kind of a reabsorption or kind of a, an improvement in the, the skin by absorption or um, the kind of resetting or kind of um, uh, the, the fibrosis has to resolve in the skin and that, that takes time. 
And these are the antibody levels in patients. And you know, one of the things that we found with, with high-dose therapy and transplant, even though we were seeing clinical improvement, is oftentimes we didn't see much of a change in antibody levels. But you can see here in the uh, lupus panel, uh, that, which is A, you can see that the anti-double-stranded DNA, uh, single-stranded DNA, and other antibodies, anti-Smith, all were showing that they were markedly decreased after uh, treatment. If one goes down to these um, to scleroderma, you can see that, again that there's improvement in the antibody levels. So the other thing that um, with any kind of treatment, uh, we have to be able to demonstrate that there that there's safety. And with patients who have cancer, uh, patients with lymphoma. Uh, we uh, have seen that that there are significant potential risks. I mean, it probably is still safer than than transplant, but we see that there can be risks associated with treatment with CAR T cell therapy, and the the uh, the safety probably relates to the burden of disease. So that if patients have a lot of disease, a lot of lymphoma coming into the CAR T cell therapy, we can see a lot of other potential complications like. Uh, CRS, which is on the sec, uh, second line here, uh, which is cytokine release syndrome, or ICANS, which is basically a measure of neurologic toxicity. I think one of the very interesting things that we see here is that if you look at, again, these are 15 patients, uh, lupus for the first eight, um, idiopathic inflammatory myositis, the next three, and then the next four are systemic sclerosis. But if you look at the CRS grade, and these grades are from one to five, there was only one patient who had sort of a grade two CRS and, um, and the patient appeared to do well otherwise. Uh, and then all the other, grade, other grades were either zero or one, which actually is terrific uh, with respect to the um, cytokine release syndrome associated with treatment of patients with autoimmune disease. And then if you look at neurotoxicity, there was only one patient that had any evidence of neurotoxicity. And again, it was only a, uh, a score of one, which is very mild. Uh, bone marrow toxicity, we didn't see any patients or there was no patients seen with bone marrow toxicity. And this was defined as um, uh, where patients don't recover their, their blood counts after the, the treatment. Um, <clears throat> and then patients, uh, tocil, uh, tocilizumab and glucocorticoid therapy is given to patients with um, CRS and or neurotoxicity. You can, you can see here that only a minority of patients actually were treated for um, neurotoxicity or CRS. And then long-term toxicity, looking out to, uh, beyond uh, uh, 12 months, uh, but looking at three months, three to six months, uh, six to 12 months, there really were not uh, significant issues identified with respect to longer-term follow-up in these patients. And these are effects. So a URTI is upper respiratory tract infection. You can see you know, some of these are related to uh, COVID, because these studies were done when COVID was, uh, um, there was a pandemic going on with COVID, uh, and the patients actually seemed to tolerate those fine. Um, and then you can see other causes of the RTI, flu, um, respiratory syncytial virus, et cetera. So really kind of very minimal long-term complications. So I think that the overall, um, the initial kind of study here looks very promising. So based on this data and some other data, um, studies are now being opened, <clears throat> are being opened for CAR T cell uh, therapy of patients with severe refractory autoimmune disease. So we have, <clears throat> we have this study opening up for lupus, uh, idiopathic inflammatory myopathy, and systemic uh, sclerosis. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we want to uh, see, one, we want to see effectiveness, we, but we also want to see if there are side effects, um, what the side effects might be associated with treatment. So again, cytokine release syndrome, neurotoxicity, and effects on uh, bone marrow. There's gonna be three arms to the study. Uh, cohort one is gonna be for lupus patients. Cohort two is gonna be for myositis patients. And cohort three is gonna be for systemic sclerosis patients. And again, this is gonna be a dose finding study where we're gonna be looking for the uh, numbers of CAR T cells that are, that are going to be given to patients coming into uh, treatment. And then for, and I'm just going to speak here about systemic sclerosis. Uh, these are the key inclusion criteria. So they have to have a diagnosis of uh, systemic sclerosis. 
the have to have a positive ANA, anti-nuclear antibody. The patients have to have significant uh, disease duration less than five years, significant um, skin score, so a skin score of greater than 15 at screening and increasing over time. Uh, if patients are being admitted to the study just for their skin uh, activity and extent of skin, uh, they also have to have inflammatory changes as we see in the blood, so C-reactive protein or urethrocyte uh, sedimentation rate, the ESR, and then uh, looking at the HACDI, which is a functional score of how patients might do, um, how they're doing with their systemic sclerosis. <clears throat> the other criteria for patients coming onto the study is diffuse or limited systemic sclerosis with ILD or interstitial uh, lung disease. And so they have to have changes on their high-res high uh, CT scan of the chest and uh, again, be less than five years from transplant. Um, and then they have to have failed uh, at least one therapy. Um, and uh, so, and failed for at, le in a, at least been given a trial of therapy for three months and they would have to have failed at mycophenolic mofetil, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, or tocilizumab. Uh, key exclusion criteria, as uh, uh, David mentioned, uh, there can be sort of issues with the uh, vasculature with the lungs. So patients that they have significant pulmonary hypertension would be excluded. If there's significant GI problems, lower GI problems, they would be ex uh, excluded. And then if they have prior scleroderma renal crisis, they would be excluded from the, uh, the study. So this is the, uh, the study so that there would be a screening period where patients are evaluated before the study uh, uh, start uh, or before they start treatment. Then they would be, have their uh, cells collected. Um, when the cells are collected, it's then sent off to um, a manufacturing area where the, the uh, T cells from patients are uh, genetically modified to express a uh, chimeric antigen receptor, which is gonna recognize CD19, which is on the uh, B cells of the recipients, and so that they would eliminate these B cells. Um, then patients would uh, go on to uh, receive um, some therapy to try and, and kind of uh, reduce the uh, strength of the host immune system to allow these cells to take for a period of time. So there's some chemotherapy that's gonna be administered. Um, <clears throat> And then the, the CAR T cells would be infused, and then we would mon uh, monitor these patients after the, uh, after the treatment as to how they're doing and monitor them closely for the development of any uh, side effects. So, um, so I think that that's the presentation that we have. I, I don't know if there's any questions um, there, regarding the you. clinical trials. Yeah, thank you so much, <clears throat> um, Dr. Nash and Dr. Carmen. We really appreciate it. There are a couple of questions. Um, so the first one, so is the gene added to your T cells by CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R, from our own DNA or something else? So the, uh, so I'm not too sure I understand the question. Sure, it, the question is, so is, Sorry. So is the gene added to our T cells by CRISPR? CRISPR. E CRISPR. Is that from our own DNA or is that something else? So it's, it's going to be something else. I mean, these are fragments of DNA which can be manufactured um, and they would just be uh, kind of placed in. The CRISPR procedure just allows the localization and the insertion of the genes. Um, <clears throat> so it's actually kind of a in a, a DNA sequence that's being manufactured and is placed into the uh, into the um, genomic sequence of the T cells, and then the T cells express the the protein for the the CAR, which is a chimeric antigen receptor, which then would recognize the uh, the CD19 protein on uh, the B cells, and then the, when there's interaction between the CAR T cell and the B cell the B cells are then eliminated or destroyed. Great, thank you. Um, Tiffany's asking, can anyone with um, scleroderma qualify for a stem cell transplant? Or if not, what is needed to qualify? So, <clears throat> so David can probably answer 
this question uh, better than I. So how about if I tackle it first and then maybe David can mm -hmm. follow up? But, uh, I mean, there are many patients that can do well with sclerodermia. They have very limited disease or it's not progressing. Really what transplant is, um, we're trying to treat patients that have severe disease who have a poor prognosis. Um, so we don't want patients that are early in, in the course of the disease or have mild disease, but we don't want patients who are very so severe that they're going to have a hard time uh, tolerating the, the transplant. So right now we're focused on patients with severe skin uh, disease and uh, interstitial lung disease. So David, you might want to talk about. Yeah. You know, so, I, you know, well. the difference between the way we use stem cell transplant and say CAR T is we're not looking at stem cell transplant in the framework of a study. So there's a little bit um, greater flexibility in terms of the patients that um, can be treated with or a lot more flexibility in terms of the treatments that can be, uh, be um, the stem cell treatments that can be, uh, you know, the patients that can get that. Um, and it's, it's a difficult balance because as Dr. Nash, you know, stem cell transplant is no joke. You know, it's, your, it's big chemotherapy that wipes out your bone marrow and, as, a, as a method to try to, like I said, confirm <clears throat> staff. So you need to, uh, on the one hand, um, have, have severe enough disease that will fail therapies, um, but we also need to get this early on in the course before, you know, real damage occurs in your lungs and your skin and your kidneys, what, you know, what have you. Um, so, and that's really basically a feel for how you're doing and how your physician is, your rheumatologist is treating you and what you may have tried and failed. And um, there's, there's no pat answer. It really depends on the severity of the disease and how refractory you are to treatment. And then in the context of trying to do this early enough so that we are giving a toxic therapy to somebody who's going to out, you know, benefit from it rather than mostly get sick from it. I hope that explains. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I'm a transplant physician and one of the, the jobs I have is to, I mean, with David sort of identifying patients or with referring physicians, identifying patients who we think might benefit from transplant so that they have a poor prognosis, but yet their disease isn't so far progressed that we can do the transplant safely. If a patient comes in and they've got bad hearts, uh, if they've got bad kidneys, then we're going to be having, you know, questions as to whether we can actually do the transplant safely, or if they have very severe lung disease. Uh, so these are things that I'm kind of, that's one of the reasons that I'm interested in CAR T-cell therapy. And I made the point that some of these four patients that actually were reported on, that they had some heart disease, or they, one of the patients had uh, what appeared to be severe kidney disease, and they seemed to tolerate the treatment that well. So I, I don't know if we can do that early on as we're kind of getting some experience with CAR T-cell therapy and scleroderma, but I think ultimately this might be an approach for trying to treat some of these patients with a more advanced disease or heart disease or kidney disease. Um, just to add in, what Dr. Nash is um, implicitly saying, and in rheumatology, a lot of our treatments are, we basically steal a lot of treatments from the oncologists, but we just use them in smaller doses uh, to the, because they have to be used more chronically and will hopefully not be as toxic. Uh, stem cell transplant has been around for a long time, uh, much more than 25 years, but um, we found that it's useful for scleroderma, but it's just a big gun. It's a lot to go through. Mm -hmm. And so the hope is that CAR T therapy will be, um, have a similar outcome, but just a lot less toxic. Now we have CAR T therapy experience from the oncologist. They use it for B cell lymphoma. So that's how we know that T cells can be um, conditioned or produced to suppress B cell population. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so the next question I think was answered, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Does CAR T um, therapy require you to destroy your current immune system through chemotherapy? So maybe. So the, the chemotherapy, so when we infuse cells, one of the concerns is that you're, um, you want to make some space for the, the gene-modified cells coming into your system. Um, because if you just infuse the cells, the cells aren't going to really multiply and, and reproduce and expand. So we administer really kind of mod modified doses or kind of mild doses of chemotherapy just to kind of have an effect on the immune system to allow the, the cells to take. But once those cells take, the, um, 
the cells will attack the B cells. And as David showed, I mean, the, the immune system, one way, one of the ways of looking at the immune system is that there are B cells and T cells. The B cells are, uh, are targeted by the CAR T cells. And, and it's the B cells that are, we think, active in, in most cases of, of these autoimmune diseases and T cells as well. But there's interactions between the B and T cells so that the, the, CAR, the CAR T cells attack and destroy the B cells. And so there's, there's a modification or there's changes happening in the immune system. And longer term, what we can see is that one, hopefully there is control of the disease process, but two, that there can be sort of low levels of, of uh, antibodies in your system after the treatment. So that may, would have to be monitored and uh, you, people may need sort of infusions of antibodies longer term. That doesn't happen with all the patients, but it does happen with some patients. Great. Right. Uh, David, any, any comments? Uh, no, no, that was good. Okay. So the, the next one is one we get a lot. Why are all the research trials for patients diagnosed within the last five years? <laughs> <laughs> we get that question a lot. <laughs> I'm sorry. I missed the, I missed the, did, can you say that again? Why are all the research trials for pa for only patients diagnosed within the last five years? Because we want to catch them early. So the understand when there's a is a new therapy like CAR T, the FDA is taking a very close look at these problem at this disease. And the reason why we ha can't use the sickest patients is because if one patient dies, then it destroys the entire study. So we we need patients that are healthy enough that will tolerate it, but also we need patients that will uh, are best apt to respond to it. So the as you know as we were showing with the pathology. The more fibrosis that sets in, the less likely we are to be able to reverse that. We don't know how to treat scarring. We know how to treat inflammation. So um, the earlier on you are in your disease, the more likely you are to be able to respond to these therapies. Right. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just add another comment. I mean, I mean, this is one of the criteria we use for, for transplant um, as well, because you want to, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, David, but it was thought then that um, a lot of the disease activity is going to occur within the first five years. So that mm -hmm. organ damage was going to be happening within the first five years and that it may sort of settle out longer term. Now, I mean, I've certainly seen patients with active scler uh, uh, systemic sclerosis beyond five years. But at the time that we were doing the transplant studies, we selected that because it was thought that many patients that the process may be settling down and there wouldn't be sort of more active disease beyond five years. And we just wanted to be safe, that we weren't transplanting patients that maybe didn't have as active a disease process um, that would sort of lead to a poor prognosis. That's true. Sure. A lot of the patients with longstanding scleroderma, um, you know, the active disease is for three years or something like that. And then you're left with whatever you haven't been able to prevent um, is now permanent with scarring, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think the other question is um, pretty similar to what you guys just talked about. Do you expect that there will be um, inclusion criteria for those with the disease longer down the road? So um, I can't speak for CAR T cells. And I suspect yes. That um, it, So again, this is part of the, the clinical trial mm -hmm. sort of kind of situation we're in right now is that when we write clinical trials and we have eligibility criteria, that's kind of the law. Unless if we do make a change, it's a formal process. We have to go to the FDA, et cetera. Once we get beyond that, I mean, then it becomes really the discretion of the physicians managing those patients. Once, once we know that it's an effective, safe therapy. So for instance, if we see patients, and David, you know, again, I, I'd appreciate your comments on this, but if we see patients with active disease and we've, we've seen those patients where they're losing, you know, some lung function, they're, they've got active skin. And even if they're beyond five years, we know that transplants can be an effective therapy. We would consider those patients for, for transplant. That's exactly right. Um, it, it, the, everybody's, every individual is different. While 90% of people have a disease that runs three years and then that's sort of the active inflammation is over, not everyone's like that. And the immune system and scleroderma um, can be a disease of fits and starts. And so you can have uh, active disease years down the road or, or slow indolent getting progressively worse. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of patterns that we com don't completely understand why they are, but 
that's the word. That's what it is. And so we have to meet the, the mm. patient where they are. Um, and I, I must say, I, I'm very impressed with Dr. Nash's ability to get people's insurances to qualify them for transplant. Oh, um, oh. That I'm always surprised. Um, but um, anyway, they're they're very. Um, his team is very efficient and very. I don't know. I'm impressed with them in terms of how they can get these these things done and through your insurance, et cetera. So in these days today. Um, Stem cell transplant is, has much more flexibility. We're at the dawn of CAR-T. I mean, that study that Dr. Nash showed with from the New England Journal, those scleroderma patients, none of them are even a year out of their therapy. So these are all brand, this is a brand new uh, realm that we're moving into. And that's why we have to go in with small steps, uh, you know, dipping our foot in the water with how to, how to manage uh, uh, CAR-T with scleroderma. Thank you. And do you have the time for just two more questions? Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. Um, so somebody's asking, um, I assume there will be a control group. If so, if I'm part of the control group, is there any benefit to the treatment if it turns out to be successful? Uh, meaning, will the control group participants be given priority to CAR-T therapy before phase four? Does that make sense? Yeah, they don't know how to, there's no control group. <clears throat> they don't know how to make a control group because okay. you're either getting treatment or you're not. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, somebody would like to know how they can um, be part of the trial. Will you be sending out a link to a form to sign up or? Yeah. So, so one of the things, um, you know, speak to your rheumatologist, um, but um, I mean, you could either contact uh, Mountain Rheumatology, uh, David Corman, uh, or uh, here, and again, we were talking about this before the meeting. I mean, th the name of our group here uh, is the Colorado Blood Cancer Institute. So we're basically a cell therapy group, but um, we've got the cancer word in there, but we also are treating patients with autoimmune diseases, uh, NS and other types of autoimmune disease. Um, just because, I mean, transplants were first done for patients with cancer, and that is just the way things developed. So that you can contact the Colorado Blood Cancer Institute as well. Uh, Sarah Wright and Kat Boer are on the, uh, on this, at this meeting as well, and, and they'd be happy to talk to you. So I think either, yeah. either you know, uh, Mountain Rheumatology or CBCI, if there's an interest. Great. Um, very last question, um, and it had to do with an MS question. My daughter has MS and she takes Kiza, I can't even say this, Kismatia, <laughs> um, and it blocks the B cell receptor. Is this similar? Uh, I, I'm not familiar with that medication per se. Um, I might be saying it wrong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, while, while MS is an autoimmune disease, it's really under the purview of neurologists because it's a specific disease to that um, organ um, that neurologists manage. So I don't know, but 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 certainly that's part of the over overarching concept of how we are managing autoimmune diseases. How do we disrupt that overactive B cell T cell interaction, and how do we uh, tamp down the active uh, B cells? Yes. Yeah. So, so maybe I can follow up from what David is saying is that the uh, and and this I thought was very interesting, but um, you know the a lot there's a lot of B cell therapy right now for autoimmune disease and so there's CAR T cells and then there's sort of antibody therapy targeting B cells and one of the things that was found uh, was that uh, you, you know the the antibody therapy does not appear to have as great an effect as the as CAR T cell therapy and, and B cells are kind of they're they're kind of all over the place but one of their homes is in the lymph nodes. And for CAR T cell therapy, when you look at lymph nodes after CAR T cell therapy, the lymph nodes are really kind of heavily depleted after CAR T cell therapy of B cells, where that, that may not be the case with the, the B, uh, B, cell, uh, auto, B cell antibody therapy. So that there, there's much more of a kind of an intense reduction of B cells associated with CAR T cell therapy. So, um, so MS patients uh, on B cell therapy it's effective, um, but it may not it, it may not be necessarily turning off the disease process again, just slowing down progression of the disease in many cases. But. Great. Well, thank you so much. There's no other questions here. Um, we appreciate your time, Dr. Nash and Dr. Corman. 
Um, I will be sending out this video with the other video attached to it and the link of how you sign up for it. Okay. So if there's Amanda, no other. Yeah, no, just Amanda, thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah. To speak to the group. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Yeah. Thank, thank you everybody. all so much for coming. Great. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.